1989, Matt Groening was sitting in the lobby of the Fox Network. Hired off the strength of his underground comics, he was tasked with creating animated segments for a sketch comedy show. Groening was excited, but shortly before the meeting, he had learned some distressing news. Anything he created for the show would be owned by the network. So, in the lobby, Groening quickly drew a new set of characters named after his own family. A father named Homer, a mother named Marge, and two sisters named Lisa and Maggie. For the son, Groening didn't want to give away what he was doing. And that's how the Simpsons were born. At least, that's how Groening tells it. The degree to which this famous story is true is sometimes up for debate. But one thing is for sure. Neither Groening nor anyone at Fox had any idea just how big this cartoon family would be. They had no idea how The Simpsons would go on to change the world. Countless people have influenced and contributed to The Simpsons over the years, but the original concept of the show was developed by three guys. These three guys. Matt Groening, James L. Brooks, and Sam Simon. But to tell this story and how these three wise men met each other, we have to start with Matt Groening. Before I jump into Matt's story, I should acknowledge that much of what I learned while researching this video came from the book The Simpsons, An Uncensored, Unauthorized History by John Ortved, which I believe is a must-read for Simpsons fans. Anyway, Matt Groening grew up in Portland, and from a young age, he was drawing. Groening hated school and would spend a lot of his class time drawing cartoons. After high school, Groening attended a college called Evergreen State, which he described as a hippie college. There, Groening honed his skills as the editor of the school newspaper, where he made satirical political cartoons. Groening's targets were often institutions like schools and government, and he developed a sharp, subversive sensibility. After graduation, Groening moved to Los Angeles and worked a series of miserable odd jobs. In his spare time, he'd write and draw a comic called Life in Hell. In later interviews, Groening has said what the hell of the title referred to was Los Angeles and his time there. Groening would mostly distribute the comics to his friends and customers of the record store he worked at, but slowly the popularity of the strip began to grow. Soon after, it was picked up by the Los Angeles Reader, an alternative newspaper, as a weekly feature. By the late 80s, Life in Hell was all over Los Angeles, and it eventually found its way into the hands of James L. Brooks. If you were a movie or TV fan in the 80s, you knew the name James L. Brooks. Brooks had created the massively popular sitcoms The Mary Tyler Moore Show and Taxi. These shows weren't just funny, they had a beating heart that connected with audiences. Through these shows, Brooks introduced the world to stars like Christopher Lloyd and Danny DeVito. If that weren't enough, in the 80s, Brooks was enjoying a successful run of feature films, writing and directing movies like Broadcast News and Terms of Endearment, the latter of which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. It was safe to say that in the industry, James L. Brooks was a living legend. An opportunity from him could change your life. Brooks' assistant, Polly Platt, bought Brooks a Life in Hell comic strip for his birthday. And so, when Brooks was looking for animated shorts, he called Graining. The shorts were to act as bumpers for a new sketch series, The Tracy Ullman Show. Brooks called Graining and asked him to do a series of shorts with the characters from Life of Hell. Graining agreed, but later learned that the deal would mean Life in Hell characters could be merchandised by Fox. Fearing that he'd lose his main source of income, Groening hurriedly came up with a new idea. Groening definitely had a limited amount of time to create the characters, so he modeled them after his own family. Groening's designs were crude. He assumed they would be cleaned up by the animation team working on the shorts. They were not. As a result, the shorts retained Groening's edgy, counterculture feel. For the voices of the characters, the network didn't want to spend too much additional money. They asked Dan Castellaneta and Julie Kavner, two cast members on The Tracy Ullman Show, to provide the voices for Homer and Marge. Kavner used a slightly altered version of her normal speaking voice. My voice was very tired, as it is now, and I said, well, what about this? I just kind of exaggerated the tiredness, and he said, fine. Castellaneta did an impression of actor Walter Matthau. A woman named Nancy Cartwright auditioned for Lisa, but she saw an image of Bart and asked to try his voice out as well. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? He's the number one guy. Cartwright was cast as Bart. Yeardley Smith also auditioned for Bart, but both Smith and Groening agreed that she'd be better suited to play his sister, Lisa. 
The animation was completed cheaply at a small studio called Klasky Chupo, run by newly arrived Hungarian immigrants Gabor Chupo and Arlene Klasky. The colorist at Klasky Chupo was named Georgi Pellucci, and before beginning work on the shorts, she heard Graining remark that he found the coloring of skin on most cartoons freakish. Pellucci decided to do something different. She colored the skin of the characters yellow and Marge's hair blue. Graining, Brooks, and the team were surprised, but decided to go with it. The colors popped. No other cartoon looked quite like The Simpsons. On April 19, 1987, the first Simpsons short debuted on TV. Even before that, it was clear that the team was onto something. Writer Jay Kogan remembers first reactions to the shorts. At the Tracy Ullman Show, we used to uh, show The Simpsons back to back, uh, the little shorts back to back to the audience. And they laughed significantly more than they actually left at the Tracy Ullman show. <laughs> but the shorts may have remained as popular shorts, had it not been for the drinking habits of one David Silverman. Silverman was an animator on the original shorts and a lifelong animation fan. At a party for the Ullman show, Silverman got drunk and worked up the courage to walk over to James L. Brooks. Silverman told Brooks how much it would mean to the world of animation to have a sophisticated animated sitcom on primetime television. Brooks was moved by Silverman's passion, and decided to attempt to launch a Simpsons TV show. Brooks pitched to the struggling Fox network, who, in search of a hit, was looking to try something fresh. Brooks was given the go-ahead to develop The Simpsons as a series. To do that, he enlisted the help of our third wise man, Sam Simon. Sam Simon used to joke that he was just a kid from Beverly Hills who got lucky. In short, Simon grew up rich. He was neighbors with Groucho Marx, and when his dog ran away, Elvis brought it back. In college, Simon, like Graining, took to cartooning. Soon after college, Simon got a job as a storyboard artist for Filmation Studios, where he worked on shows like Fat Albert. Simon was also a talented writer. He wrote a spec script for Taxi created by James L. Brooks and soon joined the staff. He later became the showrunner. He was well-respected in the industry and liked by Brooks. Soon after, due to his work on Taxi and his experience with animation, he got the call from Brooks to work on The Simpsons. Together, Graining, Brooks, and Simon developed The Simpsons into a series. The scope of the shorts was limited, and the world of the show needed to be filled in. They decided on a job for Homer at the nuclear power plant and chose a setting. They decided on the fictional Springfield, so named because it was the most common name for a town in America. It was this malleable thing that could do whatever we wanted it to. We did think it was supposed to be America. Graining and Simon worked with character designers to expand the cast. When the drawing came back for Homer's boss, Mr. Burns, Simon thought the look was all wrong. Originally conceived as a stout 1930s-style gangster, Simon redrew the character to look more gaunt and vulture-like. To voice these new characters, actors Hank Azaria and Harry Shear were hired to fill out the cast. Brooks looked to develop the existing characters into more recognizable human beings. As Simon remembers it, Brooks walked into the writer's room one day and said, Lisa should be a genius. In the shorts, Lisa and Bart are interchangeable hellions, but Brooks wanted the dynamic to be more balanced. He insisted on a Lisa-centric episode, Moaning Lisa, where a depressed Lisa meets and immediately loses her hero, saxophonist Bleeding Gums Murphy. Brooks' early sitcoms, which you should really see if you haven't, set themselves apart with humor as well as emotional depth. Brooks tried to do the same thing with The Simpsons. He ensured it had a soul. Graining also pitched in on that front. He would veto ideas he saw as too negative, often saying that a joke or story beat was sour. But Graining had other concerns as well. Now divorced from Deborah Kaplan, he was solely in charge of The Simpsons merchandise and was the only person who could sign off on it. Graining was also the face of the show, doing constant interviews to promote it. In those interviews, Simon felt that Graining was taking credit for work that was not his. Though Graining was an important voice on the show, he was not always in the writer's room, working on each individual script. That was Simon's responsibility. James L. Brooks, in addition to his role in developing the show, had another important part to play. He protected the show from the network. Brooks was so powerful in television at the time that he was able to block any interference from Fox, virtually unheard of in the world of TV. Despite infighting behind the scenes and some shoddy animation from Klasky Chupo, The Simpsons premiered to record numbers on Fox, launching a cultural phenomenon. Meanwhile, the resentment between Simon and Graining grew. 
Before the premiere, Simon would tell the staff that the show was 13 and out, meaning it would be canceled after the first 13 episodes. Simon meant that the writing staff should not be inhibited by anything. They were going to be canceled anyway, so they might as well make the show the best it could be. But Groening was hurt by the catchphrase. He thought Simon didn't care if the show was a failure. I've actually heard like him imitate me. We're 13 and out. We're 13 and out. That's not what I meant. I meant that it was like, hey, relax. Take the pressure off. We're, let's have fun here. Let's do a great show. Meanwhile, Simon tried to ignore all the press around Graining, but eventually it started to get to him. Simon felt Graining was taking credit for his work. Simon stayed on as showrunner for the next two seasons, but left before work started on the fourth season. Before leaving, he signed a lucrative deal to retain royalties as long as the show continued running. It ran for longer than either Simon or the network could have ever expected. Even years after his departure, Simon continued to net more than $10 million for his work on The Simpsons. He retired at 35 and dedicated himself to charity work, mainly for environmental causes and animal rights issues. It appeared that Sam Simon was living the good life. Tragically though, that life was cut short. Simon was diagnosed with terminal cancer in 2012 and given six months to live. He ended up living for three more years. During that time, Simon recorded this interview with the television archive, which I pulled a lot from for this video. Close to his passing, Simon seems grateful for his time on The Simpsons, and whatever happened between him and Graining, Simon seems to have forgiven it. I used to think I didn't get enough credit and uh, that I was underpaid. Now I think not only am I overpaid, I think everybody's overpaid, but everybody got rich and everybody should just drop the other nonsense. It just doesn't matter anymore. Sam Simon passed away in March 2015, and from what I can tell, the world lost a wise man. I also will note that while I don't have the time to go into this, Research for this video led me to some pretty dark stuff about both Graining and Brooks, and from an outside perspective, Sam Simon seemed like a pretty good guy. Anyway, back to the show. After Simon left, Al Jean and Mike Reese took over as Simpsons showrunners. The show was a hit, a new animation studio had been hired, and Jean and Reese looked to continue that success. For one, they continued Simon's tradition of smart hiring and their most important hire was a lanky, red-haired writer who had recently quit Saturday Night Live. Conan O'Brien was at a crossroads in his life. Over the course of one year, 1991, his fiance left him, his sitcom was not picked up, and feeling completely lost, he had quit a job most comedy writers would kill for. Luckily for him, not long after, Gene and Reese gave him a call. O'Brien was anxious at first, but became comfortable in the writer's room quickly. Conan was never a Simpsons showrunner, but he penned a season four episode that changed the direction of the show forever. Specifically, Marge versus the monorail. Well, sir, there's nothing on earth like a genuine, bona fide, electrified six-car monorail. What'd I say? Monorail! In the episode, a con man named Lyle Lanley, voiced by the great Phil Hartman, offers to implement a fancy new monorail in Springfield and Marge is the only one who can see through his scam. The plot may not sound particularly remarkable, but the episode's style of humor was noticeably different from what came before. The Simpsons had always been animated, but it had never before behaved so much like a cartoon. O'Brien and the writers kept the characters consistent, but for the first time, the rules of reality could be bent for a joke. O'Brien used this to craft jokes like this, where Lanley finds himself in a town he has previously ripped off. There he is, seat 3F. <laughs> or this with guest star Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Didn't I? O'Brien went on to write a number of classic episodes, but Marge vs. the Monorail cemented him a permanent place in the show's history. For the next four years, Gene, Reese, O'Brien, and a murderer's row of other comedy writers would write some of the best episodes of American comedy ever made. This era, from season four to eight, is still referred to by many hardcore fans as the golden age of the show. A lot of what I read while researching this video described The Simpsons as a very cynical show. At the time of its debut, TV families were mostly kind to each other, and the outlook of most sitcoms, and most television in general, was pretty positive. That was not the case with The Simpsons. 
If Springfield was a microcosm of 90s America, the show's view of America wasn't pleasant. The police were incompetent, the schools were oppressive, and the town was owned by an ancient evil businessman. The Simpsons was popular enough that it spawned many imitators, and along with politics making the world population more cynical in general, The Simpsons doesn't even read like an edgy show anymore. The larger culture has caught up to the show's worldview. I think that's because The Simpsons slipped in some subversive ideas that younger viewers picked up. Ingrained in the show is Matt Groening's long-held distrust of institutions. Don't you think we ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons? Look, Lisa, it's McGriff. And of people in power. Thinks just because he led the free world he can act like a big shot. Stupid president. But with that cynicism came moving reminders that the Simpsons care about one another. Like in one of my favorite episodes, Marge Be Not Proud, where Marge corners Bart after catching him shoplifting, believing he stole a video game. Oh, sweetie, this is the best present a mother could get. Mm, 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 mm. Or this reminder of why Homer works a job he hates after he papers over a sign with pictures of Maggie. For all its outward cynicism, I don't believe The Simpsons, in its best years at least, to be a bitter show. It cared about its characters, and its characters cared about each other. As to how it changed the world, I don't think it's a stretch to say it shaped the minds of a lot of people in it. And for that, I'm grateful. So, that was our rundown on The Simpsons. Anything we missed? Any movies or TV shows you'd like to see us cover in the future? Leave us a comment below, and remember to subscribe to Screen Rant for more Conan O'Brien-focused history.